The Heart of Africa, two weeks in Zambia, Zimbabwe, Botswana on a wildlife safari filled with memorable moments. A lion walking right between our vehicles on the way to a watering hole. He approaches a lioness who rejects the male's advances. She's a little more friendly a few minutes later. But mostly, the lions are just interested in getting a drink from the only place that has any water for miles around. We watch this Wild Kingdom scene from just yards away. Male giraffes sparring with each other, testing their strength, using their long necks as clubs. Usually these matches end in a draw without any serious injuries. A baby elephant, just days old, protected by her mother and the rest of her herd. Another herd of elephants drinking from a river at sundown. Getting enough to eat and drink is a constant challenge for elephants. A full-grown male needs to eat more than 300 pounds of food every day and drink up to 40 gallons of water. On other game drives, we found a leopard streaking through the bush until it finds a comfy place to rest safely in a tree. A hippo ambling across the road. More hippos popping up out of the river as we float by on a boat. A 12-foot long Nile crocodile slithering along a riverbank. Water buck with their distinctive toilet seat rear ends. A rhinoceros mother and her calf protected by armed guards around the clock to keep poachers from killing them for their horns. These are southern white rhinos which have recovered from near extinction over the past century, but their population has declined in recent years, so they still need protection. There were large herds of Cape Buffalo. They may look like domestic cows, but they're one of the most dangerous animals in Africa. Although they don't look quite so threatening with oxpecker birds riding on their backs. We saw extremely rare African wild dogs hanging out in the shade of a tree. Some of these animals, also called painted dogs, wear radio tracking collars so researchers can learn more about them and help them survive. You know, when they are about to follow the mothers, now they are vulnerable to your leopards, your hyenas, your, your lions would also take them. They're called painted dogs because of the distinctive markings on their fur. Finding animals on the vast plains and woodlands of Central Africa can be challenging. It takes skill and serendipity patience and persistence, keen eyes and good hearing, a lot of looking and a little luck. The hunt can be exhilarating and exhausting, bouncing around on a dirt track or off track through the bush in 100 degree oven-like heat. But it pays off when we find our first lions lounging just a few feet away. While they may be the top predator on the food chain, as long as they're not hunting, they spend much of their time sleeping. After that first sighting, we saw many more lions, often very close by. As long as we stay in our vehicles, they mostly ignore us because they don't see us as predators or prey. And there were birds birds and more birds, too many to remember their names.
Our guide's ability to find wildlife was incredible. Even driving down the road at 20 miles an hour, they could spot a warthog in the bushes 100 yards away, a jackal blending into the grasses on the savanna plains, a fleeting, faraway glance of an eagle, a gathering of vultures that could point to a recent animal kill where we might find predators or scavengers. The guides would also find tracks in the dirt or bones along the road. With the help of the guides, we saw an abundance of animals, everything from antelope to zebras, and almost everything in between. On each game drive, we would take a break to have snacks, tea, coffee, cookies, or a sundowner, a cold drink or wine as we watched the sun set on another day's adventure. Even in the dark, our guides were able to find animals with the help of spotlights, which surprisingly didn't seem to bother the animals. And when word comes from one of the other guides that he's found a leopard on this dark night, it's off to the races for us. Some animals were easy to find. Impalas were everywhere. Our guides called them fast food, an abundant meal for lions and other predators. Baboons were common. They can be aggressive and seem threatening, but they were fascinating to watch as they dug through the mud and the grass looking for snacks, while nearby, a mother nursed her baby. Giraffes can't hide in the bush, so they were easy to spot. Elephant encounters were frequent. At times, they would cross the road right in front of us. And occasionally, the animals came to us. This amazing sight was right outside our dining tent. Our game drive departure was delayed for an hour that morning as two elephants gorged themselves on tasty fruit from palm trees at our front door. They tossed the baseball-sized fruit into their mouths and spit out the seeds one after another. It was fascinating to watch. Right in front of another camp, elephants spent all morning munching on branches, about the only food left at the end of the dry season. One of our camps overlooked the Kafui River in Zambia, so we spent a day on the water, a much smoother ride than the safari vehicles, and saw lots of wildlife as we cruised by. There was also a chance to go fishing for anyone who wanted to. We spent more time on the water in the Okavango Delta, taking a ride in a Makoro, African canoes with guides using poles to push us through the shallow waters. It was a relaxing way to see wildlife and learn about the fragile ecosystem that's threatened by a severe and prolonged drought. Despite the low water, the delta still attracts a lot of wildlife, as large as elephants, and as small as this tiny frog. We stayed at four different camps, and wherever we arrived, we were greeted by the staff with a welcoming song. All of the camps were quite comfortable with large dining areas, a lounge for relaxing during the heat of the day, and thankfully a bar with lots of ice. One of the camps even had a swimming pool, and taking a dip was a welcome relief from the heat. The camps all had nice views with a chance to see more wildlife. 
Our accommodations were mostly in roomy platform tents with comfortable beds and some upscale touches like the cleverly folded towels. The beds all had mosquito netting, although we weren't really bothered much by insects. The tents all had hot and cold running water, showers, and flush toilets. Once inside our tents at night, the rule was stay inside. You never know what might be lurking in the darkness. We had an air horn to call for help in case of emergency. We never needed the horn, but we were tempted one night when the roar of a lion uncomfortably close kept us awake for an hour or more. The food at all of the camps was delicious, beautifully presented, and plentiful. The meals were impressive considering how remote the camps are. Food was prepared in a cramped kitchen where it must have been sweltering hot when the oven was on. It had to be a challenge making meals for 30 people every day, guests and staff. Linen and our personal laundry was washed by hand and dried in the sun, a free service to the guests. Water at most camps came from a well. Electricity was mostly solar power or from a backup generator. Getting to a couple of the camps was an adventure in itself, flying on small planes to dirt landing strips scraped out of the bush. The staff at the camps were mostly from nearby villages. Some of the local women demonstrated how they make baskets to sell, an important source of income, and they showed us how much skill and patience it takes to weave a basket. There were 12 in our group, including six of us from Colorado, all friends. Greg and Joe O'Malley, Paul and Margot Hoffman, Roger Wolf and Deborah Bayless. Our tour company, Overseas Adventure Travel, makes a point of arranging interactions with local people on their trips. So we spent a day at a typical village in Zimbabwe where the residents demonstrated how they live, pounding grain into a powder to make polenta a staple of the diet. Paul found out that it's pretty hard work patching the stucco that wears off in the rain, making bricks from mud and water. Jo got her hands dirty helping out. Extended families live together in the village, which may have several hundred people. The village chief mostly settles squabbles, enforces rules, and presides over ceremonies like weddings. There were mostly women in the village when we visited. They told us many men leave home to earn a living. Our tour group thanked the villagers with a donation of food staples. We bought the supplies across the road at a dusty strip of tiny shops. Our guide gave us a list of food and other items to buy for the villagers. There are no Walmarts here. Each shop had just a limited selection of goods, so you have to shop around and hope you can find what you need. At another village in Zimbabwe, we saw a hand-powered pump, the only source of water for residents. There are often food stands with open-air cooking near villages. At a large outdoor market in Livingston, we spent some time on our own, wandering through the stalls, beating some of the vendors, maybe buying a souvenir. The market is open every day and sells everything from fresh food to clothes, beans to brooms. One evening, we had dinner hosted by a local family and learned more about what they eat and how they live. Another day, we visited a school where the kids were eager to learn despite the hot and crowded classrooms. And one day, Paul, who's a drummer, got to play with some local musicians. Everywhere we went, we found people friendly and welcoming, especially the kids.
Our last day on the tour was at Victoria Falls. The natives called it the smoke that thunders because during high water there's so much mist it looks like smoke and you can barely see the falls. During our visit the flow was low so we could get a good look at the falls. They stretch for over a mile along a ridge before plunging into a 350 foot deep gorge. Most people are content to see the falls from a safe distance. But some daredevils dare to venture right to the edge of the falls to take a dip in what is aptly named the Devil's Pool. As we were preparing to leave on the last day of our tour, we had a surprise treat. Music by Amazulu, the group that originally wrote and recorded The Lion Sleeps Tonight. It was one last musical memory of a most memorable trip.